Hello students, looking at current affairs for 24th April, the news items picked up from the Hindu newspaper are these 10, we we'll look at them in detail. The first one, Sri Lanka links Easter blast to Christchurch mosque attacks. So the serial bomb blast which took place in Sri Lanka on Easter Sunday, which resulted in 2 or 320 people losing their lives. Now the Sri Lankan government says that this is, this is initial evidence links this to the Christchurch mosque shootings in New Zealand, which happened on 15th March 2019. So this is Sri Lankan State Minister of Defense who has given this statement in the parliament. He said that this was meant as a retaliation for the mosque shootings that in church, you know, serial bomb attacks have taken place. So it has been over 48 hours after the coordinated blast that Islamic State claimed responsibility for the attacks. Till that time, no more terrorist organization had claimed responsibility, but now it has. It's Amak News Agency reported so. So um, Amak News Agency is of Islamic State. And in this blast, you should know at least 45 children were killed, according to UNICEF. And among those killed, 34 were foreign nationals. The next is judges panel to hear charges against cgi so three member committee of supreme court judges has been formed which is led by justice s a bopre so he's the number two judge in the supreme court means the judge next after the cgi in terms of seniority so he this three member committee comprising of the next senior most judge plus also the number three judge in the supreme court justice n v ramanna and a lady judge justice indra benerji so this three member committee of supreme court judges has been formed which will look into allegations of sexual harassment raised by a former employee against the cgi justice ranjan Gogoi. so it is considered as a crisis for the independence of the judiciary or for the judiciary as an institution. So this is being looked into. The next is India may stop oil imports from Iran. So we have discussed this yesterday too that the USA has clearly stated that it is not going to extend the exemption from sanctions which is going to end for the eight countries including India for which these exemptions from sanctions were provided for six months, which ends on May 2. So, the Petroleum Minister Dharmendra Mardhan said that India plans to increase imports from of oil from major oil producing nations other than Iran now. So, it means it, it indicates that we are agreeing to the US plan, we are giving in to the US plan that Iran's oil exports should be reduced to zero. So, if we don't, then we will be having sanctions imposed. So, there are these secondary sanctions which will be imposed. Means sanctions actually against, uh, actually on Iran. But then anybody else who has engagement with Iran would also be facing sanctions. So these are called secondary sanctions. So this revocation of waiver means any country violating the ban would face US sanctions. So it has, US has also clearly stated that India's escrow account which is used for rupee real trade cannot be operated either after the May 2 deadline. So we actually had an escrow account means Indian currency is rupee and Iranian currency is real. So we can have exchange. So, you know, payment be done in rupee real form, not involving the dollar. Because international trade generally happens with dollar. So, this escrow account which India has was a way in which we were, you know, averting sanctions. But then US has clearly stated that even this escrow account cannot be operated after the deadline of May 2. So, that is there. So, no change in the exemption uh, will be there. Means the exemption which is given for India's investment in Chabahar port, which will act as a trade route to Afghanistan, that is that will remain. So that has been clarified by USA that you can have this. India's investment in Chabahar port can continue, but all other trading will stop. So that is it. So secondary sanctions you can see, which will come into effect from May 2, 2019, means US will place strict financial curbs on any entity or company violating the oil sanctions. They will also be a ban on the use of SWIFT banking international transaction system by the companies there will be seizure of any u.s asset of those companies which are trading with usa with trading with iran and also curtailing any other do dollar sanctions so that is that so u.s has drawn a direct link between the cooperation it is providing to india because india has been assist assisted by usa recently in the investigation of the pulwama terror attack in shutting down terror heavens in pakistan also in designating masood azhar as a terrorist u.s has taken a lead you know so these cooperation with uh, India on these aspects, USA is directly linked to India's cooperation in dealing with Iran. So that is the pressure USA is putting on India. So these, this is the entire timeline of US sanctions against Iran. In the first phase, which started in August 2018, Iran 
Iran's uh, business transactions, uh, you know, which were affected because of U.S. sanctions being reimposed because U.S.A. withdrew from the JCPOA, Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, it announced so. So you can see the airplanes uh, sector, you know, aero sector, then even, uh, you know, gold and uh, carpets from Iran, pistachio export from Iran, cars, all this business would be affected. And here you can see India was using both Euro and Rupee trade route with Iran. And India also used a Yuko Bank. So Yuko Bank of India facilitated Rupee trade with Iran. No? So actually UK Bank is the preferred bank because it does not have any dealing in US. So if it, it, since it does not deal with US, it cannot be sanctioned. So in, we have seen it has the US has clearly stated this time that such escrow account also cannot be used. Rupee real trade can also not be used. So, you know, at that time, earlier, to avoid the sanctions, you can see Iran was willing to take some of the payment in rupee. It would preferred euro payment. So, that was how transactions were taking place. So, for oil, India is dependent on various countries and Iran is the third largest oil supplier for India in 2017-18. Then next is, Gujarat told to pay rupees 50 lakh to Bilkis Banu. So the Supreme Court has ordered Gujarat government to pay the 2002 Gujarat communal riots victim Bilkis Yaqub Rasul a compensation of rupees 50 lakhs. Also, she should be given a government job and government housing in the area of her choice. So you should know about Bilkis Banu case of 2002. She witnessed the devastation of her family. She was pregnant when she was gang raped by a mob. She was 19 years old and seven members of her family were killed in a village here in Ahmedabad in March 2002. Also, her infant daughter was smashed against the wall before her own eyes. So, the Chief Justice says that the need of the R is to rehabilitate the victim who, according to the lawyer, is living a nomadic hand-to-mouth existence, having lost all. So, here you can see, this is the Bilkis Bano case. 14 persons, including 4 women and 4 children, were killed by an irate mob after the Bodhra or rather the Kodra riots and she was gang raped. So Supreme Court had ordered a CBI inquiry into the case in 2003 and CBI arrested all the accused which were named by the petitioner and in 2004 actually the Supreme Court transferred the case from Gujarat to Mumbai because of threat calls to the petitioner and a special court sentenced to life imprisonment 11 men for gang rape and murder. So convicts approached the Mumbai High Court, but the Bombay High Court also upheld the conviction and gave life term to 12 people. Also it set aside the acquittal of 7 persons. So they were also convicted. Then next is Vice Admiral Verma moves tribunal. So this is regarding Vice Admiral Bimal Verma. So he has once again moved the military tribunal, that is the Armed Forces Tribunal. He had earlier approached the Armed Forces Tribunal in April. Uh, as such, but uh, he withdrew his petition the next day because the tribunal told him to first explore internal remedies. So he wrote to the defense ministry, but the defense ministry has not responded to statutory complaints. So he has again moved that military tribunal. So what is his issue? His uh, his uh, his petition is uh, his uh, you know uh, petition is challenging the appointment of Vice Admiral Karambir Singh as the next Chief of Naval Staff. So the Chief of Naval Staff. You know, uh, Mr. Lamba, he is retiring on May 30, 2019. So, in March 2019, the government announced Vice Admiral Karanbir Singh as the next Navy Chief. So, he is junior to uh, Mr. Bimal Verma, Vice Admiral Bimal Verma. So, he is questioning why he was overlooked for the top post despite being the senior most in the line of command. So why his junior was appointed. So, he is contesting the appointment of his junior to the top post. So, he approached the Armed Forces Tribunal and again, so, because Defense Ministry is yet to reply to his petition, so now we will see what Armed Forces Tribunal does about the matter. So, you should know about the Armed Forces Tribunal. It was established under the Act of 2007 and, uh, you know, it has the power to, for the, uh, power to adjudicate or have a trial as such on disputes and complaints with respect to commission, appointment, enrollment and conditions of service of persons who are subject to Army Act, Navy Act and Air Force Act. So, it can further provide for appeals arising out of orders, findings and sentences of court martial also held under this Army, Navy and Air Force Acts. So, here you can see these are the two main aspects. Appeals against uh, court martials and first one is of course regarding commission, appointment, enrollment and conditions of service of uh, armed forces person. 
Then next is price control is hurting FDI in medical devices. So it is said that blanket implementation of price controls on medical devices has contributed to drastic fall in FDI in medical device sector. So industry insiders say that there has been a drastic reduction means in 2016 there were 439 million dollars of FDI in the sector and which has come in 2018 down to 66 million dollars. So this is as per the official data released by Department of Promotion of Industry and Internal Trade. So this clearly shows a decline in FDI though FDI in automatic route has been allowed. So India actually imports 70% of its medical devices. And you know, manufacture of high end medical devices has recently been started in the country. So, there has been a fall in this sector, but it is said, other experts say that it cannot be attributed only to price control because it says during election year also there's fall in FDI and also because Indian medical devices are being manufactured. So, the you know, foreign sector FDI is, is reducing. So, you can see in 2015, central government approved 100% FDI in the medical devices. Uh, sector via automatic route. So previously medical devices uh, came under pharma sector. So though there was 100% FDI, you know, uh, but that automatic route was allowed in case of new engines. But later it has been decided for all. So here you can see. So approval of a foreign investment promotion board was needed in acquisition of existing companies. But that has been changed now. So now it is 100% FDI overall. Uh, not just for new ventures, but also for acquisition of existing companies because it was argued that there are no major, you know, in that, um, major firms, no big firms for medical devices in India. So, there is no threat of merger or acquisition. So, that is where this was allowed, 100% FDI and automatic route. So, there are two routes for FDI, foreign direct investment, automatic route and uh, FIPB route, that is foreign investment promotion board route. That approval is required. So, this is the case. So this you should know about how price control has been brought in for uh, medical devices. It started with stents actually. So here you can see the details recent uh, you know, FDI downfall too. It was very high in 2016 but it has gone down now. This is from year 2000 to 2018. So you can see st stents prices were coronary stents prices were brought under price regulation. You can see it was in 2016 that health ministry included coronary stents in national list of essential medicines. So in December, Department of Pharmaceuticals also added stents in schedule of drug price control order. So National Pharmaceutical Pricing Authority also came with an order fixing the prices of cardiac stents. And uh, you know it was essential because the high hospitals inflated rates of stents by 250 to 1000% before prices were kept. So there was huge, you know, uh, huge benefit which was kept by the hospitals in price of stents so that had to be curbed so that was uh, how it started but then again price controls on uh, uh, medical devices in general has been uh, an issue what government plans to issue medical price controls in order to make cost of medical devices uniform across india so it will halve the cost of various uh, medical devices because cardiac stents also they're imported from usa so that was there but the pharma industry, of course, opposed the proposal. They said that it will scare off foreign investors. And the uh, center said that it is required to incentivize investors under Make in India programs. So they assist Make in India in medical devices. So overall, also, drug price control order proposes that there should be a price cap on drugs, on medicines. So it called for printing price on packs in indelible ink to be mandatory. And it formalized, uh, you know, profit margin. 8% stockist margin and 16% retail margin. So that was proposed. So this is said to be the fourth wave of price control in medical sector. So first wave was when essential drugs price control was brought in. Second wave is when uh, you know, stents and knee implants price was controlled in 2016 and 2017 respectively. That was the second wave. Third wave came when government uh, mandated state governments came up with uh, controlling medical procedure costs. And now this latest policy of overall price margins for drugs being low, cap price margins being capped, you know, as you can see, 8% and 16%. So this is said to be the fourth wave of uh, you know, price control on medical devices. The next is Kim to 
meet Putin in Vladivostok this week. So this is North Korean leader Kim Jong Un and Russian President Vladimir Putin who are due to meet on 25th April 2019 in Vladivostok, which is Russian port city in the Pacific. So they will discuss the international standoff over uh, North Korea's Pyongyang is North Korea's capital, North Korea's nuclear program. So we had seen recently how the second U.S. North Korea summit in Vietnam in February 2019 broke down. So post this, uh, oops, uh, there has been a lacunae. So now efforts are being on by the North Korean leader to build foreign support so that North Korea can get relief from sanctions. So this is regarding the first summit between North Korean leader Kim Jong-un and US President. So they signed a joint agreement after this historic meeting in June 2017. That was in uh, June 2018 in Sentosa Island. So in June 2018 was the first meet and the main points uh, which were part of this agreement you can see were regarding North, North Korea committing to work towards complete denuclearization of Korean Peninsula, US committing to provide security guarantees to North Korea and they both establishing new relations, building lasting peace and you know also recovering the remains of US soldiers who died in North Korea was one aspect which US insisted on. So they committed on this aspect. So basically it is complete denuclearization which has to be worked toward but then again that has been the ambiguity. USA feels that it should be once and for all that North Korea should give up its nuclear power but North Korea wants it to be a slow process. It says sanctions also should be gradually removed and we will also give up our nuclear power while USA insists no we will give up completely the, nu uh, the nuclearization process and we'll remove. after that we will remove sanctions. So that was the deadlock. So after that June meet, the second US-North Korea meet, Trump Kim meet, took place in Feb 2019 in Hanoi in Vietnam. But then these talks broke down because they could not agree with each other. So North Korea won is of course it wants economic sanctions imposed on it by US and UN to be removed. And also it wants declaration of the 1950-53 Korean War to be formally over. Presently it's only a truce which has been done on the Korean War. So it wants it to be declared ended. So after the first date in June 2018, the first summit, you can see US suspended joint military exercise with its ally South Korea to pacify North Korea. To, it's a, it was a confidence building measure, but then it did not ease economic sanctions against North Korea. And North Korea didn't conduct a nuclear test or fired a long range missile, but it has taken no steps towards nuclear disarmament. So it was a deadlock. And they could not agree further in the second summit too. It broke down after one day. It did not come, they did not complete the summit too. The summit was declared broken down. So second summit it was not successful. The next is RBI swap auction gets bids more than thrice the notified amount. So this was the second dollar rupee buy sell auction which was conducted by RBI and it got 255 bids worth 18.65 billion dollars compared with the notified amount of 5 billion dollars. So you can see even it got more than thrice the notified amount. So even the second dollar rupee buy sell auction, a dollar rupee buy sell auction of RBI was successful. So you know, dealers said that high cutoff premium indicated banks mostly stayed away. It was companies and NBFC which saw it as a good opportunity to lower their hedging costs compared with the secondary market. So means basically companies need you know, external commercial borrowing is route is used by you know, companies to raise funds. So they find this route, uh, 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 you know, the route of a dollar rupee buy sell auction more cost effective. So there are lower hedging costs here compared to the secondary market. So that is why RBI said that liquid uh, RBI saw a very good response. What happens actually in this dollar rupee buy sell auction is RBI is buying dollars from the market, injecting rupee in the economy. So it is bringing in liquidity in the economy. So basically RBI wants to inject liquidity. So in the first leg, in the first dollar rupee buy sell swap auction, RBI injected a liquidity of 34,874 crores. In the second swap also, liquidity will be infused, you can see. The move would help shore up the country's foreign exchange reserves too because we are buying dollar. So foreign exchange reserves, which is now close to 415 billion dollars will be further boosted because RBI is buying dollars. So it will have the dollars with it. And it is said to be an additional toolkit for liquidity management for RBI. So to bring in liquidity to ease liquidity in the economy, it generally conducts open market operations. What are open market operations also you should understand. 
so here the detail is given regarding open market operations too so here you can see open market operations so what uh, what a uh, what a central bank like rbi as a central bank of india what a central bank like usa has its central bank us federal reserve so a central bank actually buys government bonds and uh, gives in money in the economy so puts in money in the economy so that's what open market operations and central banks will buy bonds and inject liquidity in the economy so it actually buys these government bonds from commercial banks because commercial banks have these bonds and this is to bring in liquidity in the economy it will buy bonds and when it wants to control inflation what it will do is it will sell the bonds sell the bonds to commercial banks and commercial banks will take up the money so it will reduce the money in the economy and curb inflation presently the issue or concern in front of the rbi is not inflation but rather like lack of liquidity or very low liquidity in the economy so there is need of you know more money supply in the economy so that's what it is doing open market operations is one way what it is presently doing to give money in the economy it is initiating this rupee dollar buy sell auction so means here not just banks but other entities can also participate so that is there whoever's dollars dollars can be sold up so actually there is bidding which takes place so here you can see so um, so presently you can see on march 26 rbi had got 5 billion dollars through similar swap auction and uh, now you know presently also it has brought in dollars so rbi has done this plus rbi has also announced open market operations so after this was done at last tendering was there in the auction too so it helps send in the rupee also so another additional advantage which we got because of this but dollar rupee buy sell swap auction is rupee got stranded against the dollar so it gained against the dollar so that is also there and rbi has announced bond purchases also means apart from this uh, dollar rupee buy sell swap a uh, second one too it has announced that it would be easing liquidity further it would be buying rupees 25000 crore bonds in two rounds in may 2019 so that has also been announced means apart from injecting liquidity presently it is going to inject further liquidity so this purchase of government securities and the open market operations will take place in two phases so this will bring in an um, uh, aggregate amount of 250 billion rupees in the economy in may 2019 in two rounds so two auctions will take place of 125 billion rupees each so according to dealers liquidity deficit in the market is more than 1 lakh crore rupees so this is been taken care of by rbi now Here you can see the details. This was five billion dollar buy sell swap auction announced. So this was the first one announced. So how it fared is shown here. And this is regarding open market operations, which we just discussed. The write up on it too. What it is? It's a monetary policy tool used by central bank of the country to either increase or decrease money supply in the economy by sale or purchase of government securities, bonds or government securities. It means the same. then next is png india guilty of not passing on gst rate cut so gst profiteering investigation arm that is directorate general of anti profiteering has found fraud fast moving consumer goods firm procter and gamble png india guilty of not passing on gst rate cut benefits to the tune of 250 crore rupees to its consumers so the director general of anti profiteering investigated the books of accounts of procter and gamble india pre and post november 2017 and concluded that the consumer goods manufacturer had not lowered the prices of certain products despite a cut in gst rate to 18% from 28% so now this is the finding so national anti profiteering authority will pass the final order on the quantum of profiteering after hearing the company's views too. so you should know about this uh, No, this, this arrangement in under the GST Act. So there is this anti-profiteering authority who looks into such aspects. So many complaints have been received by it. Allegations that suppliers of goods or services have not passed on GST benefits to consumers. So they do look into this matter. You can see. So it's a national anti-profiteering authority which has been established under the GST Act. You can see. So. you know anti profiteering means you know it is mentioned in the gst act it uh, is a, it is an institutional mechanism now to ensure that full benefits of input tax credit and reduce gst rates on supply of goods or services is passed on to the consumers the institutional framework is there comprising of national anti profiteering authority a standing committee 
a screening committee in every state you know and there are director general of safeguards in central board of excise and customs also in place then next is shipping firms seek pm's help to stay afloat so over 2000 indian shipping companies have submitted a memorandum to prime minister narendra modi seeking his immediate intervention to scrap a recent notification and circular so they say according to them this notification and circular is forcing them to shut down which will result in heavy job losses so what are the problems of the indian shipping industry you should know so this is the notification number 2 of make in india which is dated feb 2019 so this was issued by ministry of shipping and there's a circular which was issued by director general of shipping so what they do is they equate a foreign ship taken on hire with a ship actually owned under the indian flag by an indian company so they are is considered sea right? in a foreign ship which is taken on hire so you know this actually all is there and also it gives priority in government contracts to those ships Uh, which are on hire foreign ships which are on hire in india because they were once built in india so this you know is also it, it giving priority to those ships which are not uh, used in india but they were one once built in india are been given priority in government contracts so this results in indian flag vessels being affected means indian ships owned by indian companies so why should foreign companies or ships which are not having indian flags be given any priority is the question why government contracts are giving them priority actually indian flag vessels enjoy right of first refusal you should know about rof right of first refusal so it actually enables them to match the lowest uh, rates quoted by foreign vessels that take the business so what is right of first refusal you should know here it is mentioned so it's a contractual right that gives its holder the option to enter a business transaction this has been discussed in the keywords also which have been uploaded on the website for prelims 2019 in the geography section and here you can see the detail of rof or rfr what is it so it's a contractual right means first refusal means you are offered first and if you refuse it will go to somebody else so it gives the holder of this right the option to enter a business transaction with the owner of something in this case it is regarding the government transaction business entity so any business transaction the owner of the person with this right the entity with this right will be first approached so owner of something according to specified terms has to approach the person with this right and then he can you know he is entitled to enter into a transaction with a third party third party transaction can be later so right of first refusal means if you agree if you accept then you only get the business and if you refuse then it will go to third party so that is right of first refusal so it's a general term used in business parlance so this rofr is there with the indian shipping industry so indian flag vessels have been enjoying the right of first refusal which enables them to match the lowest rates quoted by foreign vessels and take that business so this has aided the growth of indian fleet since it helps to ensure that no indian asset remains idle so they can have business and indian ship owners say that this right actually has been taken away by the government and has been given to foreign shipping companies so because of this you know circular so it is one it is equating foreign ship taken on hire with ships actually owned under indian flag and it's also given uh, the government uh, so notification giving priority in government contracts those ships which were once built in india so this is the concern so the the stakeholder here says that while we applaud the intent of the notification in respect of incentivizing ship building in india because if indian built ships are given government contracts then it will incentivize ship building in india but then those ships which are you know being used in india or are having indian flags they are being sidelined so indian companies are being affected so notification and circular is detrimental to the survival of indian shipping industry so the circular as such of the ministry and uh, the director general of shipping it says favor those who temporarily hire foreign flag assets and remit money out of india so rather than those who are investing in the indian economy with 15 to 150 million dollar asset so this is the concern so here you can see this issue as such has been in news for a long time now so it was earlier that shipping ministry had informed the industry that it intends to scrap the right of first refusal given to domestic fleet owners to ensure supply of local export import oil and bulk cargo to them at the lowest bid price so the indian ships and foreign ships you can see the imports which they have 
foreign ships account for around 67% of crude oil import and even LPG around 70% of LPG import and coastal products they have a low stake uh, coastal dry bulk also they have a major, major stake so that's why government has announced had announced that ROFR would be not there for domestic fleet owners for uh, export import of oil and bulk cargo so, that was there. so these are the news items thank you